Uh, today we have with us Professor Brian Gerardot from Heriot-Watt University. I'm going to start with a short uh, bio description and then he's going to go with the talk. So Professor Gerardot uh, obtained a bachelor's from Purdue University and a PhD in material science from UC Santa Barbara. He's chair in emerging technology from the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, and he leads the quantum photonics lab at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. So his work has been focusing on quantum optics, condensed matter physics and material science uh, on quantum dot systems. And more recently, since around the past five years or so, maybe a bit more, uh, has been working on 2D materials and their uh, more uh, super lattices, which are quite familiar to us here at MIT. So we are looking forward to your to your talk, Brian. Thanks a lot for, for coming here. Okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks to Carlos and uh, Dirk for the invitation uh, uh, to present this uh, work today. Um, so, so I guess some of the, the results I'm talking about are sort of in the, the final stages of analysis. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear any comments or discussions that might arise from this. So uh, yeah, what I'll talk about today is uh, essentially uh, magneto optical spectroscopy of mare heterostructures, where we can observe both quantum emission, uh, basically quantum light generated from mare trapped interlayer excitons, and signatures of strongly correlated states in um, by looking at the absorption for intralayer excitons. And so um, I guess one of the things I hope to convince you of is that uh, um, all of these features arise due to the Mare lattice. I know there's some controversy in the field of these quantum emitters about if they're due to some sort of intrinsic defect in the material or due to the Mare confinement, actually. And I, I um, hope to convince you it's the latter, uh, but, but uh, we'll see. So I'm happy to, to discuss uh, uh, about any of these. Um, Right, so first off, I'd like to uh, th thank the guys who, who did this work. So uh, it's really been a team effort um, between Morrow, uh, Bertrand Gilbert, Hunjun Bake, and Aiden Campbell. So uh, Hunjun, unfortunately, has left us. Uh, 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 he's gone back to Korea for a permanent position. Um, but yeah, they were, really worked uh, strongly together to, to, uh, on, on all the aspects of the work I'll talk about today. And, uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Watanabe and Taniguchi, who provided the um, HBN material that's uh, necessary um, to get sort of clean optics. Um, so yeah, so, so I'll, I'll give a brief introduction, and then uh, um, I, I guess I'll quickly um, introduce these first two works, and then I'll focus a bit more on, on these latter two works and, and this manuscript that we have. Uh, well, hopefully we'll be wrapped up soon, but we'll see. Um, so please, uh, uh, I, th I think uh, it's sort of common for you guys to sort of interrupt and ask questions along the way, but uh, if you're comfortable to do that, please just uh, just ask uh, as we go along. Um, yeah, so, so a very brief outline. So I'll, I mean, I think I'll give a very brief introduction to, to TMDs and, and Mare Superlattice. So I don't think much is needed there. And then I'll discuss our evidence for these Mare quantum emitters and then our um, um, sort of signatures we think that are of the um, strongly correlated electronic states in these materials, and in particular in the, in the valence band. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I won't go into details. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce graphene and, and these types of things, but uh, so our, our devices are, are made of these sort of a quite common uh, uh, 2D materials. So graphene, hexagonal boron nitride, and TMD. So, so graphene forms the electrical context for our samples. Boron nitride is basically used to encapsulate our active region, which is made up of the transition metal dichloride. So um, I, I guess a, a few comments about why we like the TMDs. Uh, so they're compounds in which the, the sort of single monolayer consists of a, of a heavy, heavy metal in the center of, with a layer of halogen atoms uh, above and below. And so if you look at the 2D sheet from above, it has the same sort of um, uh, hexagonal structure, similar to graphene and boron nitride. Uh, in this case, we have a, a broken inversion symmetry uh, in the center that opens up a gap, and it turns out this gap can become direct in, in the limit of a monolayer. Uh, so it means we can sort of treat these as sort of direct fan gap semiconductors. Um, and what's different here, though, as well, is that we have a, a heavy metal in the, in the center um, with predominantly d orbitals contributing to the bands, so it leads to a large spin orbit coupling uh, that splits the bands as well. And this leads to spin valley locking. 
And so, for instance, you can see in the schematic that the at the at the Cape uh, Valley we have the the ground state of valence band spin up, whereas the Cape Prime has been down. And so, spin valley locking um, leads to some very clear signatures in the magneto optics. And again, I won't I won't go into details here, but basically, we can use the um, either absorption or photoluminescence uh, from these from the TMD compounds or their heterostructures to um, sort of determine the origin of where the, the carriers reside. So there are three contributions to the to the Zeeman shift of band. So we have the spin, the valley, and the atomic orbital. Um, and these have uh, various relations for the production valence. Uh, and ultimately, it depends on the effective mass of the carriers um, uh, in these cases. So like I said, I, I won't go into details, but we can use this. Basically, if we measure G factors, we can use these magneto optics as a very clear sort of signature of where the carriers are sitting uh, in, in our structure uh, in, in the surgical space uh, by either probing the absorption or, or the emission. So, of course, the, the real magic of these 2D crystals is that we can combine them in any way we want. Uh, and in principle, with pristine interfaces, regardless of the lattice constant uh, or even the relative uh, twist between the, the layers. So, uh, this, this twist, of course, leads to uh, this long wavelength super lattice, uh, the so called Mars super lattice, uh, which can be changed uh, by changing the angle or the, or the different choices of materials. So, this example here is for a tungsten disilonide and lipton disilonide um, heterostructure. And the Mari period is related to the lattice mismatch and the twist angle, of course. And so, the lattice mismatch for uh, these two materials, which are the, the ones that our samples will be made of today. Uh, is about 0.4%. So they're very nearly aligned. So really the, the Mare um, periodicity is, is primarily determined by the twist angle. Uh, so you can see here for about a three degree twist, uh, the periodicity is about six nanometers. Uh, uh, Brian? Yes. Uh, do you mind resharing your screen? It seems that for a couple of people, the, their, the slides have become locked. Uh, yes. Uh, just resetting the share usually fixes that. Okay, hold on. Um, what do you see? Uh, now I think we, uh, it's the correct slide. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. So so. Uh, yeah, so, so for our structures, um, there, there's a, a, a very small lattice mismatch, um, primarily because we have the same collagen atom. If you switch the collagen atoms, for instance, to, to replace one of these with sulfur, then you end up with a, a much larger lattice mismatch on the order of uh, four or five percent. And so obviously your periodicity goes down. Um, so anyways, the, the nice thing is we can we can really engineer these features. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, Giving some of our MIT, uh, you know, this is what the, the results from Pablo's group really kickstarted the field uh, with these sort of remarkable observations and twisted um, um, magic angle graphene. Um, and I guess the, uh, you know, I, I won't pretend to be an expert in this. Uh, there's people there that are much more expert than myself. I guess what what's compelling about the TMDs is that um, uh, essentially it boils down to simplicity. So we have a much simpler band structure. Uh, so, for instance, we have a total degeneracy is only twofold, and the end result of this is that it means for at least for a heterobilayer, there's no magic angle. Um, you know, whereas in graphene, you need to really be quite precise in in creating the, the twist angle to observe the the strong correlation physics. In the TMDs, as long as there's perhaps not reconstruction of the Mari lattice, which happens when you're when you're very nearly aligned, especially if there's an annealing step. Then th there is no magic angle to observe the correlation physics, so it's it's much uh, sort of uh, nicer for the fabrication um, because it's 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 likely to produce something useful. Uh, maybe not the twist angle that you want, but the the, the features should be uh, sort of general to the structure, um, which which helps a lot. And as well as uh, we can we can perform optics on these samples, which is comforting for somebody like myself. So. I guess a, a few years ago, um, following the discovery of magic angle graphene, Alan McDonald and, and some others applied similar ideas to, to the 
uh, twisted TMDs, and they found for the, for the, for the valence band, uh, flat bands can emerge and one can realize a fully tunable sort of triangular Hubbard uh, model. And so the, the Hubbard model, for those who might not be familiar, is, is quite a simple idea. Um, so it essentially extends the tight binding approach, uh, which describes carriers hopping uh, between sites in the lattice with a certain amplitude T uh, to include an on-site form interaction. Uh, and this results in this sort of quite simple Hamiltonian, uh, which is two parameters, T and, and U. And the, um, the ratio of U to T uh, describes the strength of the correlations. So when this gets very large, uh, then we have these strong correlations emerge. Um, and so the, the two-dimensional Hubbard model is, is thought to provide you know, quite important insights into complex emergent phases, but it's uh, difficult to solve either analytically or numerically. And so it's except for maybe a, a, a few certain cases, for instance, at, at half filling, uh, which is the term for one electron per site, where uh, I think it's well expected that a, that a MOT insulator uh, arises with a gap that's equal to the, um, the foam interaction energy U. So it, it's sort of a compelling system to maybe uh, uh, understand this. And what's even more compelling is that in, a, in the TMD system or in, in the 2D material system, we, we can really control T and U. Um, by change by the choice of twist angle and material to change the potential. Uh, and as well, we can easily vary the chemical potential to change the number of uh, basically the fractional filling of these Mare lattice sites. So in the last uh, sort of year and a half or two years, I guess, uh, maybe a year, uh, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm about this platform. So Feng Wang group at Berkeley uh, and then the, the Matt and Shan groups uh, uh, groups at, at Cornell have sort of run with this idea. Uh, and sort of curiously, at least to me, they, they seem to always choose the WSC2, WS2 uh, heterostructures. So in each one of these cases, and there's a few more works now still focusing on this, this um, material combination. Uh, and what's been observed, or what they initially observed, were, were uh, correlated insulating states that appear at either sort of one third, two thirds, or one hole per site. Um, the Cornell group as well observed some giant G factors around uh, around a filling factor of one hole per site, uh, which are sort of taken as an indication of the magnetic susceptibility of the Mach insulator. Uh, and then more recently, they had a really beautiful work where they used sort of a, a third TMD layer as a sensor of the of the Mare uh, of, the, of the emergent betas in the Mare lattice, uh, and they see all these very uh, different fractional filling uh, uh, correlated states. Uh, as a function of filling factor, uh, which which they and, and others are beginning to explore. And equally, since then, there's uh, been a lot of theory work, which, which uh, I won't go into. I uh, don't know if I've read all these that closely, but uh, th th there's a lot of interest in this system. So in addition to the strongly sort of correlated states that, that one might imagine, uh, there are also predictions, in particular from Wang Yao and from Alan McDonald again, that the Mare superlattice could provide strong trapping potentials for the realization of quantum emitters. So uh, in principle, one should end up with basically um, carrier confinement at these different uh, atomic registries, which act as trapping sites, uh, sort of the high symmetry points in the lattice, these atomic symmetries, and these properties should be highly tunable. So we should end up with something akin to ordered arrays of quantum dots that have highly tunable uh, properties, and perhaps, um, a high density of indistinguishable emitters that could lead to things like super radiance effects or Bose-Einstein condensation uh, or, or topological effects. So it's, a, it's again, a very rich platform to, to um, explore optically. So um, maybe just uh, uh, without going into detail, uh, again, the sort of microscopic theory of how carriers and photons should interact in these sort of mare confined uh, lattices uh, has been worked out. And the, the basic idea is that due to a certain atomic um, registry, one gets a certain polarization for a certain type of uh, spin pairing. Uh, so for instance, for spin singlet pairing for the electric and hole, electron and hole, the atomic registry trapping site A, where basically the, the two layers are aligned, uh, one gets a, a right-hand super polarization for the spin singlet or, or a Z polarization for, for spin triplet uh, and so on. So at least mathematically, one can work out what's expected of the of the photons properties um, for emitters 
at certain atomic registries. So the sample that, that I'll be talking about today, actually everything I think I'll talk about today is coming from, from one sample that sort of been kept in a cryostat cold while we've been on lockdown and, and trying to measure remotely. So um, the heterostructure is a tungsten disselenide and molybdenum disselenide uh, heterostructure. So um, you can see here, um, just an optical micrograph, you can see a monolayer region of the tungsten disselenide and also bilayer region. Um, and then similarly for the molybdenum disselenide, and based on the straight edges in this, they sort of cleave along preferred edges uh, when you do mechanical exfoliation. We can then combine them uh, with a certain twist angle. So in this case, uh, we can work out optically the twist angles about three degrees, and we confirm that uh, with, with various, various other approaches as well. Um, and, and in here, you can see there's actually a bit of a junk on top of the surface of the tungsten selenide, and it happens to be little flakes of, of bilayer uh, stuck on top, and you'll see that later as well. Um, but yeah, so, so that's what the, the refractive region of our heterostructure looks like, and then we fully encapsulate it in hexagonal boron nitride, and we add top and bottom graphene gates, and a, a graphene gate that's in contact with the tungsten diselenide. So the nice thing is the hexagonal boron nitride is nearly identical thickness in both cases, so we can quite easily control independently the uh, electric field, the vertical electric field in the device, or the doping, or we can uh, apply a combination of the two. Um, and with any sort of combination of, of two TMDs, any heterostructure of two TMDs, one ends up in the type two band alignment. So it um, doesn't matter which ones you choose. So for molybdenum disselenide and tungsten disselenide, the band alignment looks like this. So if you excite uh, with, with uh, uh, the electron hole pairs in the system, the holes will quickly quickly relax to the tungsten disselenide, and the electrons quickly relax to the molybdenum disselenide layer. And this creates uh, what we call an interlayer uh, exciton um, that has a large permanent dipole moment that perhaps we can take advantage of. Um, and so in our experiments today, we'll be talking about both interlayer excitons, which we observe in photoluminescence, which is sort of this sort of picture, as we look at this interlayer exciton, or intralayer excitons, which are basically the sort of intrinsic A excitons of each independent layer uh, that we can probe in absorption uh, using the two different, um, uh, well, basically using uh, resonant reflectivity. So if we look in, in photoluminescence, basically we can uh, do a PLE type experiment so we can excite across either the molybdenum disselenide or the tungsten disselenide and then look at the interlayer exciton emission. And we see these sharp peaks arise uh, as we hit one or the other uh, resonance. This is a good indication. This is an interlayer exciton. And we see these peaks are quite sharp. So on the or they are on the order of 100 microEV. So well below the, the sort of intrinsic uh, limit of the 2D interlayer excitons in PL. And we can probe these with magneto optics, and they have a remarkable uniformity of, of G factors, for instance. So, as you can see in this plot here, so the G factors are, I'd say, extraordinarily uniform, uh, about 16 in this particular sample. Uh, as well, we observe that we have no fine structure splitting, which is kind of unusual for a, a semiconductor quantum dot like uh, system um, because of the, the C3 rotational symmetry of the, of the atomic registry. Uh, of the intrinsic lattice. And then uh, as well, we can see very clearly resolved uh, circular polarization um, with a helicity depending on the atomic registry. Uh, so, so our results are sort of uh, in agreement with the, the first result from John Ju's group. Um, uh, and we probed a little bit more and sort of engineered the states um, by adding extra layers as well. So there's a, a, perhaps an opportunity for quantum engineering. And, and these features that we observe are really distinguishing features of this uh, um, of the Mare super lattice. So it's not expected to arise due to a defect. Um, and we can further probe these. So I should admit these, these states are not bright. So um, we can uh, sort of search around for isolated single emitter uh, and filter it and do lifetime measurement and um, Amber Brown twist sort of anti-bunching experiment to see if it's uh, acting like a single quantum emitter. And indeed, we can 
uh, get antibunching below 0.5, indicative of a, of a quantum emitter. Um, so it confirms the, the quantum nature of these trapped excitons. Um, further, because we have this uh, nice device where we can sort of independently control the electric and, and field in the doping, we can apply uh, electric field. And really, because we have this huge permanent dipole, uh, we can tune these across a huge range in energy. So in this case, we tune about 40 milli electron volts, which uh, at least to my knowledge is, is sort of the largest tunability of a, using the Stark effect uh, of, a, of a quantum emitter. Um, so that's quite nice. And, and again, confirms the, um, the interlayer nature of these uh, trapped exotons. So I, I guess there's uh, probably four or five works that sort of um, sort of agree with this picture, or, or I, I should say these results are consistent with four or five works. Um, but there's a, a lot of um, sort of other works on very nearly identical or nominally identical um, types of heterostructures. And I guess the, there's sort of different um, details in each of these papers, and, and there's many more now as well. Uh, but the basic idea is that there's much broader peaks, so about 100 times broader than, than what I just uh, talked about. Uh, so sort of 5 MeV in the best case, maybe 10 MeV um, is quite typical. And there's also sort of multi-peak spectra. Um, and so this has sort of opened a debate, at least if I read the referee reports, about sort of uh, uh, are these really truly Mare excitons, or are they just sort of trapped in some sort of defect? Um, so we wanted to investigate this a bit more closely. Um, so here I show a sort of a, a, well, it's a simple power dependence. So we see the extraordinarily low power, so you know, less than a nanowatt of excitation. Um, we see the sharp peaks. And as we start increasing in excitation um, or in, in excitation power, we have a clear transition from these sort of sharp isolated spectral peaks that they then merge together. And also they start to blue shift at a certain point. And then at high excitation powers, we observe another peak uh, arise. And the line width of this uh, sort of what, what I would call an ensemble uh, interlayer emission peak uh, corresponds to about 5 MeV. So it's, it's on par with sort of the, the best reports out there. So it's a clean material. Uh, so we wanted to investigate this further. Um, our sort of hypothesis was that these two transitions arise from um, uh, uh, either spin singlet or spin triplet uh, configuration for the excitons, uh, as you can see uh, from these two um, schematics. Um, and so we wanted to probe this using magneto optics. And when we do this, we see that indeed, um, if we look at low excitation power, so this is 20 nanowatts on the, on the bottom here versus the high excitation uh, spectra, and we look at helicity resolved emission, so sigma plus or sigma minus, we see that the G factors for the ensemble peak and for the, for the single sharp peaks are identical. So they each have a, a G factor of about uh, close to six, negative 16, whereas the other peak, uh, which we ascribe to the spin singlet, has a, G, a positive G factor. So you can see the opposite slope here uh, of about 12. And um, this, this sort of based on the um, spin configuration agrees with the expected uh, G factors for spin singlet and spin triplet states. As well, um, you know, as I said earlier, we have these uh, a large out of plane dipole for these interlayer excitons. And if you look closely here, you also see a blue shift in this sort of main peak arising. And that's due to strong dipole-dipole interactions. And we can model this um, using work previously done on interlayer excitons um, for, from these papers here, uh, and extract essentially an, an interlayer exciton density. And the sort of the, the rough conclusion is that for the twist angle that we have in our sample, uh, the Mare density is much, much higher, about 100 times higher than our exciton density. So we're still essentially working with single interlayer trapped exitons. They show all the same features. Uh, as the when we have the single peaks, but there's just an ensemble of them, uh, and they're starting to interact, sort of uh, having a bit of dipolar repulsion. Uh, but they're they're 
in, in principle, the, the same species of exocon. And we can, again, now if we tune the doping in the structure, uh, and again, compare the low excitation intensity to the high excitation intensity, uh, we see results like this. So at zero applied bias, we have our neutral interlayer trapped exotons, and then uh, at a threshold, we overcome the binding energy and, and we have a, a lower energy on-site trion created. And so you can see the sort of um, peaks are broken up in the spectrum. Uh, and we observe a, a consistent binding energy between these sort of low excitation and high excitation regimes, about seven MeV. And if we look closely at the spectrum, so these are two line cuts at uh, zero volts or 0.6 volts, um, we can compare the two excitation regimes, and we again see this uh, blue shift reflected in the average emission energy due to the dipolar repulsion. We see a nice clean line width, uh, mostly single peaks. There's a bit of a, a, an extra peak here you can see here, that I'll talk about in a minute. But by and large, this sort of confirms that um, um, you know, these are the same species of, of excitons present, with just more of them in the high excitation power. And finally, if we now do an uh, excitation power dependence at now in the doped region. So we, we go to uh, actually, uh, I think it's two volts. Um, and then we take a power dependence. We see a few new peaks emerge. And uh, so line cut uh, up here at this excitation density where the, the excitation power where the white line is uh, gives us a spectrum that looks something like this. And here we see essentially four different species of interlayer excitons. I won't describe this red one that we don't understand very well, and I don't think anybody understands very well. It's been observed in other samples as well, um, in monolayer samples, uh, perhaps it's related to, to plasmon or Auger processes. Um, but we can assign these other three peaks um, to being negative trions with either intervalley uh, trions, so an intervalley configuration where basically the extra electron is in the other valley or in the same valley, uh, as you see here for the gray peak, or we can have the singlet state rather than the triplet state, where basically we have the trion, the extra carrier in the other valley, and we have the, the spin singlet transition. And again, we can confirm this with magneto optics by looking at the G factor. So you can see um, the spectra, you can see the triplet states shift together uh, in the opposite direction of the state, uh, and it gives opposite G factors suggesting again that the same conduction band is involved. So we think we can identify these different species um, and it sort of maybe gives some insight and maybe it's worth revisiting some of these other publications that have sort of multi-peak spectra um, that, uh, 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 well, perhaps the peak assignment of those uh, other publications could be revisited using this knowledge from the magneto optics uh, and, and also highlights sort of the importance of of a gate tunable device. So now this is sort of the high excitation regime. If we go to the low excitation regime, uh, sort of this picture here, we can think about sort of a, a just a Gedanken experiment, what would happen. So we start in the neutral regime with, uh, so these are sort of the, the white circles are the atomic or, or the atomic registries of the Mari lattice. And we can imagine there's maybe just a few uh, very dilute uh, density of interlayer excitons and by these uh, red and blue circles. And as we start to then add, um, change the, the Fermi energy, we start to get carriers doping into the, into the Mari lattice and they might go into these different positions. Uh, the first thing that happens, we can see that the on-site Coulomb interaction energy is negative by about seven MeV. So we expect to capture a single electron. And then as we continue doping, we can expect to start filling up some nearest neighbor sites and also some further uh, neighbors in the lattice. And as the nearest neighbor sites are, are should have the dominant interaction energy, we can expect sort of a, a signature that looks something like this. So we have a, uh, a certain energy and then we have a big jump due to this initial change. And then we expect to see perhaps like a, a staircase of uh, Coulomb interactions as we load in different carriers into the Mare lattice. And uh, I'll just go very briefly over this. Um, we can see that in our, if we zoom in on the spectra, so we have our neutral excitons shown here, uh, which we've labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. 
And then you see at a certain point, we have the on-site triumphs formed. And then we have what looks like a lot of noise and then everything sort of quiet down, quiets down again. And we're left with uh, the same emitters so we can determine these by position, determine they are identical. And as well, if we just shift the line cuts of these energies uh, at the positive and negative bias, we see that these really are the same, uh, have the same uh, emission energy just with the additional Coulomb interaction. So in this case, we've shifted the N dope by six and a half MeV and the P dope by six MeV. And we end up with a, a very good agreement. And if we now zoom in on lots of these positions, I mean, it's hard to work out the details because as you can see it's quite noisy, but we see lots of sort of steps that look something like this. So um, C and D are experimental uh, plots for, from the data. And then D, E and F are basically Monte Carlo simulation of what we might expect. Um, and so we can see the first thing is that the jumps correspond to on the order of about one MeV, uh, which uh, about half MeV, which agrees quite well with our expected uh, Mario lattice spacing for the Coulomb interaction energy. And more often than not, we see features something like this with, with sort of some steps along the way um, and, and sort of short plateaus. And we think that this is because at least in our Monte Carlo simulation, we get these features arising sort of a slope to, to these steps from uh, longer range interactions, uh, sort of uh, just adding in, in, in a bit of a slope. Uh, but every once in a while, we see features like, like this, where they really look like sort of just sent to the nearest neighbor transition. So perhaps this, this approach can be used. Uh, so, well, essentially, we're using the trapped exciton as a highly localized probe of the environment. And perhaps we can combine this with less local techniques to better understand the Mari physics. So, and now I'll, I'll switch to looking at the same sample, but looking at the absorption and, and sort of going after these strongly correlated electronic states. So again, just to, to, to highlight, we're switching the experiment now from looking at photoluminescence of these interlayer triumphs to looking at the um, absorption and reflectivity uh, of these intralayer excitons. And you'll see I've already drawn in sort of some flat bands uh, for, for the important band edges, um, which we think we have in our example. So again, this is a, a now another micrograph of our sample. We can see that there's these sort of bits of um, um, debris, which are, I think are small flakes of, of, of another monolayer on top. And if we take a, a reflectivity map of the interlayer exon, we can choose the resonance and basically um, make a map of the sample at a particular resonance, we see it corresponds quite well with the optical micrograph. And so it, as well in this sample, we have additional monolayer only regions. Uh, you can see here where the orange dot and the purple dot are. Uh, and so we can first probe these regions as a function of doping. And it looks something like this. Um, for the lipid disolenide region and for the tungsten disolenide region, uh, where we have a neutral regime, and then we have, if I could go to the next slide, we have uh, uh, signatures of Fermi polaron. So basically, because we have this sort of two-dimensional electron gas, we have our, our exciton, and it can either be feel the um, attractive or repulsive interactions with the surrounding Fermi C. And we get these two different types of interactions. So basically, it's, it's akin to a, a, a trion and a neutral exciton, although the Depending on the Fermi energy, the, the importance of the, um, the Fermi C is, is a little bit different, whether or not how, how bound the uh, particle is. So what we see are, are these different features that are they're quite well understood. Um, I won't go into details here, but the interesting thing, of course, is what happens in the, in the other region of the device. So we've looked at uh, lots of different regions in the device. You can see the in the regions where they're red here, we don't see any uh, evidence of, of Mari physics, but in these other regions, uh, we see effects that are sort of uh, what I'll present in, in the next few minutes. So the first thing that we can say is, uh, so this is all coming from position mark one here. Um, the first thing we can say is that we have the expected behavior of the type two band alignment. So with doping into the lipid diselenide conduction band or, or into the uh, valence band of the tungsten diselenide, we suppress the neutral A exciton and we create charge exitons. And that's why, for instance, the oscillator strength goes uh, very, very small 
uh, for p-doping in the tungsten bisulfonide or for n-doping in the uh, aluminum bisulfonide. And in addition, we can see that there's some clear sort of modulations uh, in the energy and intensity and intensity at specific gate biases. You can see here I've labeled this a, a one hole per site, and I'll, I'll explain why we, we name that later. Uh, and, and similarly here, so we see these these strong oscillations, and we can um, better visualize these changes with gate voltage by taking a derivative with respect to, to the voltage. And so this is the plot on the right. So it's the same data, just plotted with the derivative with respect to the gate voltage. Um, and so we can see here that we uh, have highlighted just the the one or, or two holes per site, or one or two electron holes per uh, one or two electrons per site. Uh, and we see these drastic changes in this uh, um, differential reflectivity map uh, at these biases. And this corresponds to what we can work out for the number of basically carrier density in terms of trap and, and number of carriers per, per MRI site. Um, so that works quite well. And we can actually use this as a way to sort of diagnose the, the twist angle as we look around our sample. Uh, and for the most part, it's, it's three degrees plus or minus about 0.2 degrees. Um, but then we can start to add in additional uh, lines. So we can see that there's additional modulations in this plot. And this corresponds to features at one third and two thirds, both on the electron and, and um, whole side. Uh, so you can see, for instance, this feature here stops and starts directly at two thirds. Uh, the one third, we have this feature started stopping here. Uh, and similarly, uh, on, on the electron side, and if we look closely again, we can see there are features at one half. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see. I hope I'm going slow enough that you can see, for instance, this feature stopping at uh, one half here. Uh, sorry, it's, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Uh, and, and this one, for instance, starting at, at one half here. And as well, we have the, the fractions of six uh, in the Mare lattice that, that sort of magically appear as well. So you can see, for instance, the seven six appears quite clearly. Uh, the one six, you can see this sort of sharp features stop here, uh, and so on. So, so we think we see uh, signatures of these strongly correlated states at all of these different. Uh, uh, there's a couple more at, at all of these different um, uh, fractional fillings. Um, so, it's hard to interpret these features uh, in this type of map. It's hard to get a sort of a physical intuition from this type of map, at least uh, for, for me to read this. So we switched to plotting the derivative with respect to energy rather than um, voltage. So now we're more sensitive to the peak position rather than the changes of the function of doping. And in this picture, then we get a, a, a map that looks like this. So this is again, the, the p-doping at negative and the n-doping at positive, where we've added in some of the lines from the other, um, from the other mapping uh, uh, the different fractional fillings. And what I want to focus on in the next just a couple of slides is the p-type doping and the, and the assignment of some of these peaks. So we see that there are essentially uh, two peaks associated with the living bisulfonide A exciton, uh, which we believe are uh, two Mare excitons, similar to what was reported by Feng Wang's group uh, in, in this paper, where basically, um, and we can apply sort of the, an empirical theory which basically includes just the, the Mare periodicity, periodicity and the potential uh, of the confinement. And we end up with uh, a fairly good agreement. So we get a, about a 40 MeV uh, splitting for these two Mare excitons. It basically just arises through the band folding. Uh, and in the experiment, we see 35 MeV. So it seems consistent with that picture at least. And now if we keep focusing on these two intralayer excitons, Mare excitons, we can use this as a sensor. So, you know, we have the these 1S excitons, which are basically in contact with some sort of strongly correlated states emerging in the whole layer, in the whole, uh, in the valence band of the tungsten bisulfonide uh, layer. So we can actually use these as a sensor for what's happening. So if we focus, um, uh, well, let, let me, sorry, these slides are maybe out of order. So what we see is if we focus on these on these peaks here, is that we see a dramatic shift in energy of these Mare excitons, so the red and the blue. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't even tell that black and blue, purple and blue. I'm going colorblind, I think. Um, 
uh, we see a, a, a dramatic shift in energy uh, as we go towards these strongly correlated states. And as well, the line width um, dramatically changes as we go towards the, the fractional filling of or the, the filling of one hole per site, uh, which you see here. And this is of the of the, the bright uh, black exciton here. Uh, and this this is uh, what one would expect as you go towards an ordered state. So we can go from a and also we expect a, a blue shift in energy uh, as we have a more uh, insulating type uh, um, sample that's in contact with a dielectric environment. So this is a, a fairly consistent and agrees again with our assignment of these peaks. Uh, as well, if we look at the, for instance, the line widths of these two peaks. Uh, that are in the WSE2 uh, intralayer exitons, uh, we see a, a line with collapse uh, as we get towards a, a, an ordered state of, of the Mott insulator again. So we wanted to look now uh, at more closely at these two peaks here. So the two peaks in this um, um, tungsten disolenide that correspond to the AX on the tungsten disolenide. And what we find is that um, so first we zoom in on these two peaks and we apply a magnetic field. So five Tesla in each case. And we look at the sigma minus and sigma plus polarized light. So for sigma minus, uh, this top graph here, we see the peak that we label the X plus, which is the positively charged exciton, interlayer exciton peak emerges just past zero doping. So it starts there. Uh, and then it continues with a high degree of spin polarization, which we expect due to the band alignment in our system. Um, and the other Zeeman transition is barely visible. If we look at the sigma plus case, we have the peak that we label as the neutral exciton. Uh, so we can see it, it starts consistent with the energy at zero doping, and then it undergoes some, some change in energy, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then you can see it abruptly stops at a filling of one hole per site. And that's because there are no more neutral exitons uh, to be found in the, in the system. So they're all uh, if the Marius lattice is fully filled, then we have um, uh, just charged exitons existing, which is why that X plus then peak continues down. And if we now sit at the position of one hole per site, so at the, at the, um, the doping of one hole per site, and now do magnetic field sweeps, uh, we see something like this. So we see our, our charged exciton come down and lose oscillator strength as, as due to spin polarization. And similarly for the neutral exciton and then vice versa with the other spin polarization. And so these are some of the line cuts that we have at different magnetic fields and we can fit just a simple um, uh, Lorentzian oscillator model, um, these two peaks, and we can extract from the Zeeman splitting uh, quite large ones for each of these, these states. So this is now, we do the same thing for all of the different fractional fillings. So we can see it at the fractional filling of zero, basically undoped. We have almost no Zeeman splitting uh, in this range. Uh, I can't remember what field this is at. I think this is at one Tesla. Uh, should write that there. And then um, you can see around the fractional filling of one, we have this huge Zeeman splitting. And then when it goes above two, uh, we lose the Zeeman splitting again. So this is just mapping now our, our Zeeman splitting uh, in this sort of small region uh, around one Tesla, plus or minus one Tesla. Above it, we sort of saturate back to the nominal uh, value of about negative four. And this allows us then to make a, a, an effective uh, magnetic phase diagram of these correlated whole states. Um, we can observe, observe a plateau in the G factor around uh, one whole, uh, sorry, around one, between one third and two thirds. Uh, which are predicted to be these Wigner crystals. Uh, and then we have a clear peak at, at about one hole per site, uh, which could cor correspond to the uh, Mott insulating state. And we see another peak at about 1.2, uh, which I think I don't entirely understand yet. There's some evidence for this in, uh, in theory, uh, literature, um, but perhaps we should, we should investigate more. So we're currently uh, doing a temperature dependence uh, of this sort of magnetic phase diagram which could hope, uh, from which we hope to distinguish, for instance, if these are anthropomagnetic or ferromagnetic uh, uh, ordering of the phases. So with that, I think I'll summarize. I think, uh, I think I'm okay on time. Uh, so I guess the, the main message is that in the same heterostructure, we can observe all these features that are consistent with the um, 
yeah, with, with the Mare super lattice. So we have interlayer X comp that are trapped in the Mare potentials that exhibit properties consistent with the symmetry of the lattice in, in the atomic registry. Uh, we can generate single photons with these that have a huge Stark tuning. Uh, so perhaps there's a, you know, as an outlook, a, an opportunity to couple these to cavity move to each other uh, using the, the, the large tuning. And then in the high excitation regime, we see these ensembles of these trapped excitons with multiple excitonic species, which we think sort of unifies the different pictures that, that have sort of emerged over different years for these interlayer excitons. And then in the same samples, again, due to the Mari super lattice, we see these strongly correlated electronic states. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and, and open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Brian, for the nice presentation. Do we have questions from the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Um, so my name is Hyun Moon, a graduate student in Drex Group, and thank you for the great talk. I have a question about the how do you find the individual emitters, like more attract one, as if we assume that the more pattern is on 10 nanometer scale. Um, there are going to be like more than 1,000 more trap within the optically diffraction limited spot. Um, and I'm yeah, curious so, how, yeah, can you find Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So I think the, um, the, the simple answer is we pump very, very weakly. Okay, so, you know, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly correct. We have a 1,000 emitters per site um, or, or even more. I can't remember the exact density. It's right there. Um, yeah, we have. Uh, about 10 to the 12 uh, per square centimeter. So we can work out looking at this power dependence, looking at the blue shift, our, our precise interlayer exciton density. And we see that even at our highest powers, where uh, you know, we filled less than about 1% of the Mare traps. And as we go down in density, we end up with on average about 10 or so sharp peaks that we can find. So it's just a, it's just a, um, a rate equation, you know, it's a, a combination of, of low excitation power. And I think probably at, at very low excitation powers as well, or I should say in this low excitation regime, we probably benefit or, or probably this dipolar repulsion helps push the, the location where the Mare exitons choose to sit, uh, push them away from each other so they can be a little bit more optically oscillated. But they're all sort of at different energies, as, you know, you expect some homogeneities. So then we can, you know, even if there's 40 of them there, we can sort of move around and pick one out uh, that, that is, you know, quite clean spectrally. See, thank you for the explanation. Um, actually, I have one another related question that um, those like individual ex um, trapped excitons seems like have an inhomogeneous broadening of around 10 milli electron volt. Um, so what uh, do you it's think? a little bit, it's a little bit better than that, maybe five um, milli electron volts, but yeah. I see. Um, do you have any um, idea for the reason for that inhomogeneous protein since like for the exton, I think it's usually not that inhomogeneous within the small area, like diffraction limit. So, so I think it's a, it's a matter of scale. So for the interlayer exciton, people can observe, for instance, and in, certainly in lubdum diselenide, a transform limited line width, but the, the scales on the order of two MeV, right? So the, the lifetime of those is picoseconds. And so the, the inhomogeneous line is about 2 MeV. So here we're, you know, a couple orders of magnitude smaller. Our line widths are limited to about 100 micro EV. So not as good as, you know, we're, we're far from a transform limited for these. And then the inhomogeneous broadening, I mean, the interlayer exciton peak itself is about 5 MeV broad in the ensemble region or the high excitation power, which is the best I think anybody's seen. Mm -hmm. But one expects some inhomogeneity in the local lattice. I mean, it could be down to um, a little bit of strain or a little bit of an environment. It could also be down to, you know, what, what, what's in the neighboring sites. I guess I don't have a, a perfect answer to that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's hard to compare the inhomogeneity of these with the inhomogeneity mm -hmm. of, of inter, intra layer exitons, which have a much, much, much faster lifetime. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask you a question, Brian, first of all, thanks. Really, really great talk. Uh, very interesting results. You. Um, you mentioned, so this is a, 
we can just consider this as a Bose Hubbard model, correct? Um, in the exotonic case, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the case, uh, so I'm I'm trying to think. Of, I'm interested in your thoughts about the use of that uh, for quantum simulation. Uh, let's say, how difficult would it be to try to observe, for example, in a low temperature regime, let's say superfluidity or uh, a you know mod insulator state or what has to happen to get there? Yeah, so so it's basically density. So, you know, I, I, I'm using fairly modest powers just because of our experience with, I mean, I've had PhD students burn holes in, in our plates. So I think just naively, we, we didn't excite hard. And then when we figured out the density, we were sort of surprised at how small our excitation powers were. So there's a, a paper from, um, I'm trying to think from Columbia, um, mm. Zao's group, uh, where they, this is science advances, where they claim to observe a Mott insulator uh, transition. The density here is important because you need uh, on site interactions between two excitons. That's right. So it's, it's all about our densities. Our densities are way too small. I suspect also that super radiance is likely to emerge in some degree uh, in, in this system. Um, so, so I think it's a it's a question of density. And it's, you could do density, or can you, I mean, extend the lifetime uh, of the exciton? So, so the lifetime is a sort of something that also something that's up for debate. So in principle, there's there's sort of, so, you know, as, as you take your um, K values and you misalign them from each other, right? You mm -hmm. couple less the light cone. And so there's some evidence that, I mean, certainly things get dimmer as you twist away from, perfectly aligned right and so that's also another hard thing i think for you know the field to be consistent in comparing brightness because it, it's, it's really useless to, to, to do that but you you could also be changing the lifetime as you twist away from each other so you could end up i mean people report very different lifetime values in literature also mm -hmm. suspect they're not looking at the same species of exoton so it's hard to compare you know different reports but i mean some people report lifetimes of 100 uh, of, of yeah, hundreds of microseconds, which is you know you've got this 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 electron hole pair far apart, right? So it, yeah. it should never be possible. Right. So so there's lots of exactly yeah hope hope for this, that, right? Yeah, it's but it's um I I think it's still early days to know how 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 tunable the how engineerable the system is. But so far, I think it, I think people just need to keep pushing and and I think these opportunities are there. So I, I think it's mainly down to density and lifetimes, right? It's just those ratios. And, yeah. and you can also think about, you know, putting a, a monolayer of HPN in between the two layers to separate these these exotons further. And, you know, you should have much longer lifetime then, and it's even more tunable. Mm -hmm. Right. So certainly potential to engineer these and go after these different phases. And then also, I mean, um, to reach these phases, you would have to go to low temperature. I mean, your, uh, yeah, I think I think low temperature will. What's that? I, I think low temperature will. I mean, the thing to keep in mind here is it's I guess predominantly you know down to the interactions and and the interactions are so strong in these right. So our Coulomb interactions are you know uh, factor hundred larger than in three five, right? So it could be that three Kelvin is yeah. is already good enough. Certainly, hundred millikelvin should be you know ideally is where you want to start. I see. I see. Okay. Very very cool. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Well, if I can ask another one then. Yeah, please <laughs> so go ahead, Derek. Another awesome thing will be, and um, we'll be observing sort of single, with single site resolution. That is, in the super lattice, can you observe at that length scale, which I don't know, maybe it's down to 10 nanometers. I forgot what it is in your case. Yeah, so I think we can do it just using far field spectroscopy. And um, I think I, um, hold on a minute, let me see if I can, how do I stop this? Uh -oh. What do you see now? You just see me, is that right? Yep. Um, 
I can just explain in words. It's fine too. I mean, yeah. Ah, I, I, I don't, I can't find the slide. Anyways, the, the, what we've done is, um, so, you know, if you, it, basically the resolution of determining the location of an emitter, if it's, a, you know, treated as a point source is down to signal to noise, right? So you can get well beyond the diffraction limit. Right. Just, just by looking at them. So as, as long as they're spectrally distinct, yes. you know, we can work out with accuracy, you know, approaching 10 nanometers uh, just by doing far field confocal notes. So no near field. Oh, yeah, it's but even, even better if you have better signal noise, right? So it's, you're completely limited in that case. So we've done this and we see that um, in the regime, in the low excitation regime, there's basically no correlation. I mean, every once in a while we can see what looks like, you know, three emitters forming the part of the hexagonal lattice, the right positions. I see. And, That's cool. and then we dope them and we can see, you know, as we start to dope them, we can see that they all shift together as it looks like an electron comes in between them or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's just too dilute to, to really see the Mari lattice. I, I was hoping that we could actually do this at a little bit higher power, but then everything gets, you know, all, all the all the peaks start to merge together and we can't spectrally di distinguish them. But if but you I, have different lattice sites pop up, uh... Like, what, yeah, the problem is just too high. You know, the lattice density is too high, so you need to be able to observe maybe hundreds of these simultaneously to do that. And it's too too far for us to push with just a far field experiment. So, so yeah, near field is needed, I think, to see this in the lattice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But it, it'd be beautiful to see that, and I, and I know people are trying to do this. You know, with near field approaches. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very good idea. Right. I think we can continue the discussions in the uh, in the meetings that we're having right after. So we can stay here. The rest of the people, you're welcome to 